today we're going to talk about how to train your dragon. Hello everyone and welcome to the first To Brew or Not To Brew when we talk about a class. Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. So incredibly iconic. I absolutely love dragons. Dragon, 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 dragon. Obviously in a game called Dungeons and Dragons, dragons are going to be pretty important. They are incredibly built into the fluff of the game, although I feel like they could have done more of that. Very excited for the upcoming Ice Dragon, the Near Icewind Dale, the Gem Dragons. Oh my god, the Gem Dragons. I can't wait for mine to get here are just so cool, and I absolutely love the concept of psionics and dragons, so those are two of my favorite things put together. Growing up when I was a kid, um, The Hobbit, you know, seeing smog in the animated film and eventually reading the books was really what hooked me on being a nerd. In my teen tween years reading Aragon and How to Train Your Dragon, really like dragons and I'm very excited. See this dragon? Dragon? I got that at the cloisters when I was a kid and visiting the museum, and I saw that dragon I wish they were real. Probably had something to do with dinosaurs. But anyway, why does nobody ride dragons anymore? If you look back at the fluff of Dungeons and Dragons, there were dragon riders, especially in the Dragonlance books, which I am a major fangirl of. There were dragon riders back then, so what happened to them? Why don't we have one now? Well, that was a question I was asking myself one day, and I was bored. So I went online, and voila! I found the Dragon Knight. Now, while I have not personally had the privilege of playing one yet, I'm generally the DM, but I would love to play one when I have the opportunity. One of my players in my Acquisitions Incorporated campaign did, which led to a lot of very interesting dynamics with the dragon. So now that I've established what I think of dragons, let's jump into the class itself. So the Dragon Knight is a class that I found on Reddit and also GM Binder. I will link to the person who made it and the video he did on why he made it and the thought process he went through down below. I will say it's been through seven iterations, so it's been fairly well play tested. It's gotten a lot of feedback in the community because a lot of people want to ride a dragon in D&D. And I would feel comfortable handing this class out to one of my players. It's on the curated list. I do believe almost 100% positive it's on the curated list, which will also be in the description down below. And let's see why I think so highly of it. So it starts off with some very nice fluff about the dragon knights and how baked in these orders are into the world or maybe not maybe you just found a dragon egg on a beach or in a, the woods and now you have a dragon it does also talk about the unbreakable bond between rider and dragon it means so much to them it's bonded well and similar to the beastmaster ranger only this class is the beastmaster ranger but you know done right with a dragon and that bond is just unbreakable and will always be there for the two of them and it can lead to a lot of interesting dynamics I will say this, if you're, when you hopefully allow this in your campaign, make sure to establish at session zero who will play the dragon and make sure that's not going to be awkward. Figure out what the player wants to do, who wants to play the dragon, and just make sure that's not going to be an issue. It should not be an issue, but something to think about. So I do appreciate all the fluff that they put into this class. Now, obviously, not everybody's riding around on a dragon, so why is that? And it talks about that. And as a big fan of backstory, I appreciate putting that in there under the quick build stuff. It does recommend to go strength, uh, con charisma, which is valid. However, I will also say I think I see potential for a dexterity build here where you max dex out first and you maybe do two weapon fighting so you have something to do with your bonus action unless you're going to do the elemental practice. But I'm still voting dex. I know dex is usually where we go. There could be some cool stuff you could do with pole arm master if you're going to try to tank for the rest of your party. Um, I do like dex. Strength is also valid. Pick what you like. I'm going to use it right here. It is also a charisma based class which is fine. There are a lot of charisma classes out there and charisma is an already strong stat. So, I mean, it is what it is. Um, I could also see the argument for it being a wisdom based class, but it is charisma and you know what? It works absolutely fine. I also, I know why they made it charisma because dragons are supposed to be like charismatic deal makers for some of them in the fluff. Not the case for all of them, but yeah, okay, I get it. Also ties into draconic sorcerer, so. More backstory stuff for this. That is awesome. It starts off with the covenant, which is your bond with your dragons. Is it something you wanted? Is it something you didn't want? How did it happen? Why did it happen? Backstory. Backstory, good. And now it gives us more backstory. It talks about the relationship between your dragon. Now you could roll on it. You could write it out. Then it also gives obstacles. Now owning a dragon isn't going to be easy. I know in my world I made it difficult to get around because you can't bring a dragon into a major city. But was there something else that the mother of the dragon wanted back? Did you steal it from like a dragon hatchery for an evil overlord? Do bounty hunters want to come and take your dragon? There will be challenges to owning a dragon. Make sure you work it out with your player, or, or if you are the player, make sure to work it out with your DM. And the backstory here is just so full of potential. So just really live it up and embellish on what they give you here. So now let's go over the base class feature. You have a D10 hit die, which is pretty, it's respectable. It's fighter level stuff. 
you get all the armor, all the weapons. You get con charisma for your saving throws, which is quite strong. Con is a good one to have, and charisma can be useful for when you don't want to get banished. You don't get any tool proficiencies, and you get some decent um, skills. I'd probably pick the charisma-based one just so you're not trying to be too mad, but, you know, do what fits your character. You get a decent equipment list here, a fairly standard, but all good stuff, and I'm sure I always let my players swap something out if they want to do something that doesn't fit, like, what's there. Like, if a dex-based paladin wants to use a rapier, again, talk to your DM. I'm sure you can all work it out. The multi-classing requirements are strength 13, charisma 13, like the paladin. However, warning, do not multi-class this class. It will not multi-class well. You will throw off your core class abilities wherever you multi-class out of, whatever you multi-class in and into, and you're gonna throw off all the dragon abilities because they're all tied to your dragon knight level, not your player level. So be careful with that. Again, not saying this makes this a bad class, but don't multi-class unless you're really just driven by some sort of story that you need to see through you will mechanically, in my opinion, have a disappointing character. So under your dragon covenant, you pick one of the types of dragon. It could be any type of dragon that you want. It's really cool. Make prestidigitation-like effects related to your dragon's color. So, you know, fire dragon, you can make smoke puffs. Lightning dragon, you can make tiny little sparks, I would imagine. Then it goes into actually having the dragon companion itself. If you die in battle, the dragon will do whatever is possible to get you back to life before it eventually expires itself without having your bond. You can return your dragon to life. It has to cost 25 gold pieces, but it also requires something else. You need to make a DC 15 charisma check. Now you can lower this by five by using hit dice, by expending your own hit dice. Because if you fail this, you suffer three points. On a failed check, you suffer three points of exhaustion, which is super harsh. And I guess I see where it's coming from from a narrative perspective, where you're trying to, where it's like physically draining you to bring this back to life. But still, that's rough, but flavorful. So I'm okay with it. So at first level, you get the Covenant Bonds ability. So basically, what I like here is at the first level, you're starting with the dragon. It's not like Beastmaster Ranger. Don't play Beastmaster Ranger. But it's not like Beastmaster Ranger, where you get to third level and voila! Pet. First level, you have a dragon. It's not a good dragon. You have a dragon. It can't fly, and it can't take the attack action. Instead, when you take the attack action, it can also make an attack for giving up its own action, and it deals 1d4, da 1D4 damage. So basically, similar to having like a dagger. So at first level, I know it's going to be wonky. It scales weird. Like The Dragon Knight will feel slightly stronger at lower levels, which is okay, because a lot of classes do that. Anything that dual wields at lower levels feels the same way. Anything with a pet, Beastmaster... At lower levels, that does this feels the same way because they will be slightly ahead of everybody else. However, at fifth level, when people are getting third level spells and multi-attack, it does scale off quite a bit. Actually, by the time the dragon gets to ninth level, when I math it out, I believe you're doing around the same damage as a hunter ranger or a, I want to say it was champion fighter, which is not incredible damage by any stretch of the imagination, just decent. So it's not OP in the damage area, just okay. So those first few levels are rough, but they can be for a lot of classes. Dragon has hit dice just like any other player. It makes death saving throws just like any other player. So I feel like this mechanic is a little bit more balanced than the Beastmaster. Rather than trying to force player stuff onto a pet, they basically just make your dragon another player. And they take away enough of your own features that it's not OP. It's still strong to have two bodies on the field. Not OP because you're never going to be doing a ton of damage with this class. You and your dragon always know the distance to each other. The dragon can never be made bigger than large. And the dragon's level is equal to your level for things like polymorph and tripolymorph. Then it gives you some more fluff for your dragon, some more tables. Of course, you can always work that out yourself. But the ideal is always the same for the dragon, which I think is cool. Because no matter what your relationship is, the dragon still has this animalistic intrinsic value that makes it want to protect you. You get four rather standard options for fighting styles. All of them are decent. I'd probably avoid great weapon fighting just because it's not that good unless you're trying to do like a strength-based polearm build maybe. Um, I would personally also allow players to take other styles because these are kind of restrictive. Like even two weapon fighting wouldn't break this class. So that's just some thoughts. Archery seems kind of weird with this because you're way back and your dragon's up close, but I could also see you make that work out if you take one of the practices where you don't need to be on the front lines. Um, but yeah, all pretty standard stuff. It's perfectly fine. So at second level, we start getting into some of the more juicy stuff. Your dragon gets different types of attacks now. It has a bite attack, which it can use the special attacks in amount equal to it, its strength modifier. But so it gets like a bite attack, which scales, gets a tail attack to fling some people, and it gets a wing attack to knock some people over. At third level, you get a practice, similar to other classes. You pick your subclass at third. 
which we will cover in just a second after we hit the other stuff. But at third level, you get a nice little flavor thing. I always love it when home brewers include this in these in their classes where you can identify the worth of gemstones and you can cast the identify spell as a ritual. For this class, you do get a standard amount of ability score improvements. And then at fifth level, you get coordinated attack. This is similar to the revised ranger and what probably should have been done. I don't know how to feel about a Beastmaster, but here it works really well. So basically the way it works, when you make an attack, the dragon can also make an attack and on its turn, it can make an attack. So, so your dragon gets multi-attack even though you never get it. So that's still useful. Your dragon's bite does scale with 1d4, 2d4, 3d4, and then eventually 4d4. So similar to long short attacks, that's gonna be kind of close to a fighter in terms of damage output there. Perfectly fine, great ability. And it means that you're never useless in combat and it's really focusing more on the relationship between you and your dragon than just you going in there and beating everything up by yourself. At sixth level, your dragon gets a breath weapon. The breath weapon are similar to the breath weapons for dragons in the terms of their shape. However, the damage is scaled down significantly, obviously starting at 4d6 and capping at 8d6. Cool ability. Obviously your dragon needs to have a breath weapon and I feel like it's kept relatively in line. Also at sixth level, your dragon gets magical attack. So it stays relevant throughout the course of the campaign when you eventually hit things that are immune to damage from non-magical attacks or resistance to it. At ninth level, your dragon gets more benefits. It's bigger, it can move faster, and it has advantage in all saving throws as long as it can see you. So good stuff there. At 11th level, you've become so in tune to your dragon, you get draconic-like claws and you get another thing on your body that resembles something dragon-like. Now this is representing how close you are to your dragon. I would argue you don't have to use this if you don't want to. I personally think it's really cool. If you're really against kind of turning into something dragon-like, you don't have to, I guess. It takes away from the class a bit, I think, if you don't do it, but that's just me. Work with your DM if you don't like these options. I'm sure you can work something else out though, but they're all really cool. Who wouldn't want scales or a tail? At 13th level, you get a ribbon ability. You only age one year for every five, so your lifespan is getting longer, similar to that of a dragon's insanely long one. Starting at 14th level, your dragon gets like a frightful presence light ability where it can let out a roar and frighten in an AOE. Pretty cool and good to clear those minions away from the big boss before you try to get in there and kill it. At 17th level, you get a very powerful ability, but a cool one. You get basically a mini legendary resistance that you or your dragon can use once per long rest. Very cool, shows you kind of turning into more of that draconic essence in your soul. Finally, at 20th level, you get your capstone ability. You and your dragon can swap damage for the other one because your bond is so strong and you automatically succeed on any attempts to bring it back to life. You and your dragon are now one. So now that we've talked about the base class features, let's jump into the subclasses. Starting off with the rider practice. Now the rider is the most straightforward of all of these and probably the safest pick if you're just going for something kind of base. It's kind of similar to a cavalier fighter in some of its elements. For instance, the third level ability, Dragon's Claw, when you and your dragon are within five feet of an enemy, it has disadvantage on attacks against anybody else. Great if you're going for that tank build with like Polearm Master or something like that. You can also try to grapple or shove people that are trying to leave your reach. So that's actually pretty cool. You might not need to grab Sentinel if you don't have the room for it in your ability scores. Third level, you also get a swashbuckler-like ability where you get to add your charisma modifier to your initiative rolls and so does your dragon. The last thing there is pretty useful if you're ever ambushed. Hidden creatures don't get advantage on your dragon as long as you can see it because you two are watching out for each other. At seventh level, your dragon can protect you from attacks. It can impose disadvantage on any attacks against you and you can stabilize your dragon by making a medicine check. 10th level gives you another cavalier-like ability, which has to deal with your movement, getting on and off the dragon. It makes it so you can do it quickly, and it just shows that you are a skilled rider when you're in combat. So at 15th level for the rider subclass, if you move straight towards an enemy 20 feet with your dragon, you can do an additional 2d10 piercing damage, and then it gets kind of like a flurry of fang and claws-like ability, where it gets to attack everybody around it in five feet with like a slash attack. And finally, at 18th level, your frightening presence with your dragon gets further, and if you hit someone while they're frightened of your dragon, it counts as a critical hit. Now that would score like really well with something like Great Weapon Master, which gives you a bonus action attack that this class does not innately have access to. Next up, we have the Elemental Practice. The Elemental Practice is to the Sorcerer what the Eldritch Knight is to the Wizard, kind of, if you're following that kind of mindset. If you look at the spell list, it actually scales back a little bit more too, similar to the way that Wizards know more spells than Sorcerers, Eldritch Knights know more spells than Dragon Knights. You got some relatively basic spell casting features and at third level you get an ability that it's kind of hard to pull off. So if you hit it, if you cast a spell, the next time you would hit a creature, it takes 1d4 damage of an attack. So like you would cast a spell and then it would take 1d4 damage when you hit it with a melee weapon, if I'm understanding this correctly, it could be, not, if so correct me down below. 1d4 additional damage of your dragon's weapon, if your dragon's color type when you hit it with a melee weapon. Cool, flavorful, fun. 
not that powerful, but you know, it's fine for a third level ability. Seventh level, you get combat magic, which is similar to the Eldritch Knight or the Propane Soul Blood Hunter War Magic ability, where if you hit something normally with one of those classes, you could then, with a cantrip, you could then make an attack as a bonus action. However, here, if you hit something, your dragon gets to use their reaction, so you're not giving up that multi-attack like ability that you have. At 10th level, whatever damage type your dragon is, whatever color it is, whatever damage type you get, like kind of an elemental adept like thing where any ones count as twos. It's, it's pretty good if like you pick red dragon and you're using green flame blade a lot. Destructive reach. Now I feel like this is a little weak for a 15th level ability. So half of 1d4 is not that much. But when you hit somebody with that ability, you can also pick two other people within 10 feet to take half as much damage. I mean, more damage is never a bad thing. So why not? And finally, similar to improved war magic, you get improved combat magic at 18th level, where if you cast a spell, the dragon can use its reaction. Now that's actually pretty good because you have some decent spells at that level. So you could get some interesting combinations off there with your dragon. Here we have the Valiant Practice. Now in the Valiant Practice, you make a special banner sort of weapon, mm -hmm. which has to be some sort of polearm type, and it has the same damage as your dragon's damage, whatever that might be. So if you're gonna be using it a lot actually in combat, you won't, you'll see what's coming up. You might wanna consider Elemental Adept, but you know, You'll see. So the banner's a little tricky. It's not that tricky. You just need to think about it. So as an action, you get to plant the banner, and then an ally within 10 feet can use their bonus action to trigger the banner. So it, it, all the banner buffs are pretty good. You get three at third level. The first one is 1d4 damage additional to all of their attacks until the start of their next turn. That's a pretty decent ability. If they've got nothing else to do with their bonus action, hey, 1d4 more attacks. The next one is bonus action plus one AC. That is stupid good on a paladin. And the final one is banner of agility, so you can double your movement. That's like crazy on like a monk or a rogue. So just meow, just so fast. I don't want to think about what that would be like to deal with as a DM. But those are all super cool and very useful for you to give up your action to help your allies and your allies to shake it as a bonus action. Now this class, I do feel is a little bit weaker because you are using it for action. You are using it for a decent ability, but it's not like Bardic Inspiration where it happens as a bonus action. So is it worth giving up your action? It's up to you. If you pick this class, you probably think it is. I do feel like it's one of the weaker ones, but still overall, the buffs you are providing are pretty good. So that's a decision you have to make. At seventh level, you're at least not giving up your dragon's extra reaction attack. If you wave your banner, you plant the banner and your friends all see the banner, then your dragon can use their reaction to make an attack. So that's actually really good. Also, if you're next to your dragon, the range of the banner increases to 30 feet. So even more helpful and your friends can also activate it from that distance, I do believe. So at 15th level, the banner gets better and more useful, which scales with the seventh level ability, which is really cool. It goes together very, very well. And all of the effects are now available to you for you to pick from. Also, if you get knocked down while holding that banner high, you get up to one hit point. You can use that once per rest, but that can be a very useful ability so you don't die. Finally, you get a miniature deployable Lehman's Tiny Hut, basically sort of kind of. When you plant the manor, you get to make a 10 foot wall barrier around it that will keep out creatures that you don't want in it. It needs to be dispelled by a spell of sixth level or higher, which is crazy high. I mean, not for that level, but it's still really high. And only creatures you want in there can move through it or else they get kicked out. So if you have an ally that's hurt and you need to get them to safety, having somebody drag them in there can keep them going through the fight. You can actually just like set up like a midfield hospital for your cleric to just emergency heal the blood hunter in. While it might seem like a weaker subclass at first, I think overall it does have useful abilities. You just have to be okay with not attacking. Next up, we have the straight up Bahamut subclass of the Dragon Knight, which come on, we all knew this was coming. Third level, all relevant elemental things become switched to platinum because platinum dragon. Then once per rest, you get to imbue your armor with the power of the platinum dragon. You can use your reaction to reduce incoming damage to you or an ally by 1d6 plus your Dragon Knight level. See what I said earlier about everything scaling with like your Dragon Knight level, not like your class level, don't multi-class this class. At seventh level, I think it's more of a ribbon ability. I'm not really seeing anything too useful out of it. You shed bright light. You do get an extended range to 10 feet on the reducing damage. So that's nice. They probably could have made it bigger and it wouldn't be super broken like the Ancestral Guardians, Barbarians, um, Spirit Shield. But you know, it's pretty good for a class that also has other things going for it. 15th level, you get more of a buffing ability. When you reduce damage, you can restore somebody else's hit points, temp give them temporary hit points equal to 1d6 plus your charisma modifier. At 18th level, you don't need to use your reaction to reduce damage anymore. You can just do it an amount of times equal to your charisma modifier and half your charisma modifier rounded up and you regain all uses on a rest. So really that just buffs it a little bit. I mean, you still got your reaction. So maybe for your last ASI take Sentinel. Weaker one of the subclasses, the Elemental one, like you could use Green Flame Blade and do damage. The Rider one gives you useful in combat abilities. The Banner one gives you good buffs, even if you're giving up your attack sometimes. This one, 
you like Bahamut. Let's be real. But we, we have the shadow practice. The dark, edgy practice. At third level, you dragon becomes ebony black. And all damage changes to necrotic. So, yeah, edgelord dragon. Not that there's anything wrong with being an edgelord. I love those stereotypes of characters. My favorite character was a super edgy blood hunter, Ixalan vampire. So much fun to play. So, you know, we jest, but cool concept. Let's see how it carries out in execution. Third level, you get an ability equal that you can use an amount of times equal to your charisma modifier. You can center a sphere on yourself, which makes you heavily obscured within five feet, and only your dragon can see through it. This lasts until the start of your next turn. Useful ability might keep you up in combat a little bit longer. At seventh level, you get your something called Withering Breath. So if a creature fails a saving throw up against your dragon's breath weapon, each turn its attacks get reduced by an amount equal to your charisma modifier. It also gets to make a con save at the end of each of its turns to try to offset this. So that, yes, is powerful, but it does have a lot of ways to get around it, so it's not necessarily game-breaking. At tenth level, your dragon and you get even edgier, and you can hide as a bonus action. So maybe proficiency in stealth somehow and you know maybe this would definitely be the ones you would dex build for 15th level you get a shadow monk kind ability where when you use your shroud of darkness you can teleport 30 feet to another dark area even better you become invisible until the start of your next turn or you do something to another creature finally at 18th level you get a rather useful aoe in a 30 foot area around you people need to make a saving throw equal to basically what your spell casting modifier would be and if they fail that con save, they take either they take 10 to 10 necrotic damage and either pull 15 feet towards you or push 15 feet away from you. That is incredibly good. This one, I feel, was executed slightly better than the Platinum Practice one. Maybe I'm missing something in the Platinum Practice, but I just feel like that's probably the weakest out of all the subclasses. This one got some good abilities. The hiding might not always be super useful, but especially if you're trying to tank, then it's really not useful. But it does have some overall good class features, and at the core of it, the Dragonite is still a solid class, so... I think what we've seen from the subclasses is no matter what you want to pick, you'll still be useful. Rider, you're a good fighter. Elemental, you're a spellcaster light. Banner, you have a really pretty decent banner with some decent buffs. It takes a while to get going, but overall will pick up and be very useful. Platinum Practice, you do radiant damage, which is nice, and you have some other cool abilities, but is the weakest in my opinion. And then Shadow Practice, again, takes some time to get going, but your higher level abilities are pretty decent. Finally, at the end of the document, you have all the dragons. You can pick a chromatic or a metallic. You could probably even work with your DM to work something else out. You saw with the other two, it turns to either black or um, platinum to match your practice. So you could always work something out for narrative reasons. You want to write a gem dragon, I'm sure that's doable. The cool thing here is if you are playing a chromatic dragon, it does not have to be evil. It has the same alignment as you because of your bond. Overall, I think the Dragon Knight is a pretty good class. I'm going to give it 8 out of 10 dragons. Why only 8 out of 10 rather than a 10 out of 10? I think it's good. It's definitely well balanced. However, the Platinum Practice, I do feel like some of the practices take a while to really get going. And the Platinum Practice definitely still feels weak to me at the top end of play. The class is kind of limited in fighting restrictions and doesn't do a ton of damage. However, if you want a fun, flavorful class that is not going to break your campaign, consider introducing the Dragon Knight, or if you're a player, consider playing it. I hope this video was helpful to you. Be sure to follow the applicable links down below if it was. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and until I see you again, don't forget to have fun and roll some dice.